Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be doing a short video here on Ephesians chapter 1. There was a comment left in one of my Calvinism versus Scripture videos, and he referred to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And uh, like always, like all Calvinists do, they don't really ever quote the entire verse. Uh, and that's, a, that's actually very important. And even uh, not just that, but the, the whole context of, of what is being spoken here in Ephesians chapter 1 Uh right up until verse 13, and you could go into verse 14 as well, but we'll read up to verse 13 or examine things up until verse 13. So I'll read here, and I'll uh, stop as, as I go and uh, comment a little bit as to what I believe it's saying and stuff like that. Uh, so Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. I think there's a distinction between the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus. But that we're going to leave aside here for now. But it says in here, in Christ Jesus. All right. And as I read along, I want you guys to notice that it says in him, in Christ, in him, in him. And it just, it's always referring to saved people. This is what, this is who Paul is writing to. And this is where they are. They are in Christ Jesus. So, uh, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, as according as he hath chosen us in him, all right, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So that's actually very interesting. So uh, question over here has to be asked. How does, how does one come to be in him, right? Uh, Calvinists will automatically take this and say he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And then right away assume you were there before the foundation of the world and he has chosen you from there for no apparent reason, arbitrarily, randomly chosen you to be in him now, right? Uh, you are always going to be saved. And that's not what the scripture is indicating at all. So, um, you know, does a passage state that, you know, he chooses us individually to be effectually placed in him, or does it simply state he chose us in him? You know, is that what the scriptures say? He chose us in him. Because once you're saved, you pass from death to life. Now you're in Christ because Christ's resurrection is eternal life. Now you're placed in Christ. So he has chosen us in him so those who are in Christ that didn't happen before the foundation of the world it happened at a moment in time and that is when you would have believed the gospel the truth the, the gospel of your salvation but if you read a little bit further in that that we should so what has he chosen us to do right so that's another uh, simple question like what, what, what has God chosen us to do and how has he chosen us has god chosen individuals to be just to be placed in or has god chosen individuals who are in him right those are some of the distinct things too like paul was in christ chosen to be an apostle of jesus christ was that does that mean that nobody else was saved that there was nobody else to pick from well obviously not because you had the apostles who were saved and you had many other people that were saved before before paul but for some odd reason uh, and I, th I think it's because of uh, Paul's zeal and uh, his, like he wasn't scared. He was just, whatever was true, he was going to go out there and do it. You know, he was just learning and, and stuff like that. Uh, and that shows that God can use someone like that and then places him as an apostle to the Gentiles. So there's different kinds of choosing as well, not just choosing uh, for salvation. Because that doesn't happen before the foundation of the world. You are only saved because of what you believed. Okay? He has chosen all to come to repentance and uh, belief in, in, in his son Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection. But not all believe. So that's to their own demise. It's not God's fault. Which in Calvinism, that would be God's fault because God has to regenerate first before you can believe. So you have no choice in the matter, whereas here we totally exonerate God of all um, 
wrongdoing or uh, whatever you want to call that uh, blame. You know, we exonerate him from all blame and we put all blame on man instead of putting all blame on God like the Calvinist would do. So, so that's something to, to think about. You know, does it, like, uh, does it teach that, uh, that Christ redeems us individually so that we might like irresistibly be put be put in him or does it teach you know in him we have redemption does it say that god chose us individually to be in him or does it say in him we are chosen and it's in him we are chosen so um do you know and you can put it in another way too you know has god predetermined predetermined individuals to be in a group or has god chosen a group of individuals for a predetermined end and that's very key here did he choose you to be in a group or all those people that are going to come to him he has uh, predetermined predetermined them for a specific end you know uh, so what we see in verse 4 is um, I'll just read the whole thing again. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, so those who are in Christ he has chosen, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what we were um, chosen to be before the foundation of the world. And all those that would come into Christ, he has chosen from before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what the verse is saying in verse 4. So, um, and, and then you want, like, we can read the rest of the verses too. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by the Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And this is uh, even futuristic uh, because we're, we're not still full, we're not fully redeemed yet. We still have this body, our, our, our spirit is all fully redeemed. You know, that's all uh, done with. But our bodies are, have not been redeemed yet uh, until we get that glorified body, whether it be when you die or like at the rapture in a moment, in the blink of an eye, we will be changed. We'll have a new body. Uh, so then our body will be redeemed from that point on. So this is futuristic here. And he has predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, which would line up with... Uh, uh, let's see, I think it is verse, uh, verse number 10, that in the dispensation in the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So uh, this is our predestinated in, predestination of a glorified body, and that he will gather all things in him together in one. So um, that's uh, that's how I would see verse five and you can link it to verse 10 and stuff like that so uh you know some you know they calvinists for surely they only focus really on the first 12 verses uh and verse number 13 is actually very crucial to this uh because verse 13 so when it says in all these verses in him in in christ jesus in christ and, and stuff like that well question how do you get in him right so now verse number 13 clear clarifies how you get in him so and a lot of times he's talking about, okay, the first people who believed, okay, let's just say uh, the first generation of Christians. Now it's, he, let's just say he's talking to the second generation of Christians, okay? And whom he also trusted. So the second generation, okay? These were the first fruits, now the second fruits, okay? So I'll, I'll speak to it as a generational thing because it's just a little bit more easier to understand. But, uh, and whom he also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So this is after you believe, okay? So uh, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. And that's another thing, the gospel of your salvation. That's another very important thing to understand is uh, Calvinists don't believe that words do anything. That the, that the words of the gospel actually do anything to anybody. That's why they have to have that regeneration preceding faith. God has to first make you alive before you can believe. Calvinists don't believe that there's power in words. These words have life. All right. These words are spirit and they are life. Uh, that's what we have to understand about these words. You can tell someone the gospel. 
and they can come to the knowledge of the truth, and then they can be saved and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and be saved and be sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. But again, Calvinists overlooked that, right? <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, having predestinated us into the doctrine of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his own will, of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace where he hath made us accepted. He hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through the through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And this is all when you're in Christ, all right? Uh, when you're in Christ, you have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. So that you have to believe the gospel and you're put in him and you're sealed in him. Uh, wherein he hath bounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. So, um, <clears throat> so the questions you would have to ask is, uh, uh, you know, was, was, was it before the foundation of the earth? Uh, and, you know, what does the text say? Well, verse 13 clearly says when you were in Christ, when you were put in him. And that is when you believe the gospel. So when you heard the message of truth, the, like the gospel of truth, you know, the gospel of your salvation, that is when you were put into him. Um, you know, was it before the world began and with any regard or response to the gospel? No. So uh, you, they had to respond to the gospel. You have to believe and trust the gospel. Because uh, when you believed, you were sealed in him. That's uh, in verse 13, clearly states that after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. It is all on what man will do, okay? Whether he will believe or not believe, you have that choice. But Calvinists love to take that choice away from you. So, um, you know, how do we know that uh, believers in Christ will be sanctified and glorified because God has, more, you know, sealed us in him? That's how we know and given us a spirit of... of uh, of adoption and stuff like that, and you know, a guarantee of what purpose, uh, what he has to purpose, what, what he had purpose for all, you know, um, and especially in verse number four, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That is what verse four is clearly indicating. You know, uh, the passage is not about God predetermining which individuals will be in Christ, it's about you know, God predetermining what will be. Well, become of those who are in Christ uh, through belief in his truth and stuff like that. So that that is what I gather out of all these things. I don't know. Um, for me, it just seems like it's, it's pretty clear. I don't know what you guys think, but uh, Paul here, Ephesians, uh, especially in the first verse, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, I think there's a distinction between uh, saints and uh, faithful in Jesus Christ, because if you're faithful, uh, you obviously will get more blessings and uh, be put into positions and stuff like that. Uh, whereas saints, yes, you can believe, but some are more carnal, right? They they're not seeking uh, certain things uh, or they are not growing and stuff like that. So I think that's why there's a distinction. All are promised one thing: to be sealed in Him. Okay. And that's why I think uh, verse number four, it says that we should be holy and blameless with uh, before him in love. Should, that's volitional, okay? Uh, even in verse uh, 12, uh, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now, some people display that a lot better. Some people grow more and... Uh, and put their trust more in God. Like some people don't put their trust in God. At, they're they're saved people, but they have like a, a drinking problem. Some don't put their trust in God in that, right? That that uh, he he can help them through these things. So then that hinders their walk. That hinders hinders their growth. That hinders their uh, the spiritual gifts and stuff like that. Uh, you know things that God has set up for you. You can obtain all of it. All of it you can obtain, but how how are you? What is your service to the Lord, right? How dedicated are you? 
and uh, stuff like that. So that's what I think um, there's a distinction between saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus. I think there, because I just think that there is. Let me know what you guys think about that, actually, because uh, I just found that very interesting. Because there's a saints and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. They're both saved automatically. Okay, I'm just thinking that there might be something more to the two. Why, it's, why it makes a distinction between the two. Possibly not. Maybe I'm just uh, overanalyzing it. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. But uh, like I said, that we should be to the whole, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay. Should, volitional, doesn't always happen. Okay. But uh, that's my uh, exegesis on this. Uh, that's why I don't think, verse number four, as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Chosen us, a question asked, chosen us for what? Right? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's it. Not that it's not, not, not that it's not significant, not like it, you know, that's it. But that's what he has predestined us to be, those who are in Christ. And when you get into Christ, you read verse number 13, and that uh, shows you when you are in Christ. So in all these verses, it's clearly indicating he's talking to Christians, saved people. All these verses, saved people. He's not talking to anybody lost or anything like that. He's talking to saved people. And nowhere in here indicates that you were chosen arbitrarily, randomly. I know Calvinists don't like those words, but they are true. Uh, unless you can show me otherwise. But they always try to give me examples, but... It's it, it, it's no difference. Like the one guy gave me an example of uh, the adoption. You now asked him, so why why did you uh, choose this one to adopt? Well, because we love her. You know, they thought about her a little while, and then he had said that they had said, well, because we love her, we love her. So that's random. You don't know why. You have no reason. Just that you love her. That's it. So, again, it, it's not a distinction worth a difference. Well, why didn't... If God says, for God so loved the world, then he has... He has power to love the whole entire world. He has enough love to love the entire world, but he withholds that love. So whose fault is it then? How did he end up loving you? Well, I don't know. See... They want you to read a whole bunch of literature that doesn't mean nothing, okay? Because when you're going to talk to a Calvinist, you can read all the literature, all that you want, but then you find something you're going to say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to ask them about this. Well, that part I don't believe. Well, that part I don't believe. See, they just uh, they can just randomly say, nope, that part I don't believe. Well, then all this uh, reading and stuff like that was for nothing. Like it, it meant nothing now. So I think I've complained about that before. Uh, how they act with that, but but yes, yeah, Ephesians chapter one, uh, especially up until verse thirteen or fourteen, whichever one you want to go to, uh, none of it indicates Calvinism. Uh, that's why they only ever quote verse number one or Ephesians one and verse number four, and they only read half of verse number four. They don't ever quote the entire verse, and this is how they shoot off scripture. They shoot off scripture, and then they quote scripture up until the word that they need, and then they stop. And then they quote another verse up until the word that they need, then they stop. Never in its context. And it's kind of pointless arguing with, the, with these people sometimes because uh, they can switch on you all, all that they want. Like they, they don't have a solid foundation of truth or anything like that. They just, whatever they want to, if you're going to pin them in the, in the corner of somewhere, They'll switch stances. Well, I don't believe that. And then they'll quickly switch their stance and say, well, actually, I believe more of this. Well, then you try to pin them there. Well, you know, then I believe more than that, more of this. You know, you, you're just never going to win. It's, uh, but it's fun talking to them. Mind you, like, I think uh, if you can pin them in the corner and stuff like that, uh, maybe they, they would see the error in other ways. But this is my exegesis of uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, like, share, comment. Uh, dislike doesn't matter to me. 
Um, but yeah, if you have some input on this, awesome. Like I'd love to hear some more as to what do you think certain verses say, and uh, actually what you know if I overlooked anything as to um, you know another proof verse in here somewhere that yeah this clearly indicates it's not Calvinism. But uh, you know certain questions like always you have to ask yourself questions when you're reading verses. Who is who is he talking to? Well, if he's talking to believers, then you see a trend in there, in him, in Christ Jesus, in Christ. And you see that's a trend in the verses. Okay, then he's talking to say to obviously save people. And then, okay, what has he chosen them for? Well, then you read the rest of the verse and find out what they're chosen for. And their end and stuff like that. You know, like uh, what what they're chosen for now, what they're chosen for in like as in the walk, and what their end is chosen to be like, and stuff like that. So God has rearranged everything in the beginning. That all who are going to be in Christ, this is what they should be. You know, they should bear the image of, of God, you know, to bear the image of his son, uh, to be a light in the world, uh, to be blameless. Don't like have anybody come up to you and be able to blame you for anything. And so on. This is what he has predestined us to be like. You know? Have to bear the image of God, to bear the image of his son, Jesus Christ. It's that simple. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching, and uh, hopefully I can do another one on Calvinist proof text, and then um, maybe do some more videos on that. So uh, yeah, thank you guys again, and God bless.